There you go. Welcome everyone watching us tonight live on Facebook. Tonight we discuss the spending habits of Moroccans post-coronavirus, our local services and products, the biggest winners. Moroccans around the country were anticipating the end of the nationwide lockdown on June 10, after what would be at least 82 days of state-imposed confinement, citizens look forward to regaining their routines, but amid a health crisis that confronted many with daily life's priorities, what pre-pandemic habits will Moroccans let go of, and what post-pandemic habits will Moroccans uh, hold on to? We focus on Moroccan spending, saving, and the implications they bear on local products and services. To discuss the topic, I'm joined tonight by Mr. Hassan Haddad, former Minister of Tourism, current member of Parliament, and board member of Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and IMF, and Professor Nabil Adil, research professor and head of a research group on geopolitics and geoeconomics. Uh, before we start, I would like to remind everyone watching us that our guests will also be answering questions from the audience. So please comment your questions or we'll review them before the end of the show. Let's get right to it. Um, millions of Moroccans have applied for financial aid in light of unemployment related to coronavirus. There is an uncertainty amongst Moroccans in relation to the security and stability of their jobs. Uh, Professor Adel, would you say that this and other pandemic related factors can hint to a change in the saving behavior of Moroccan households? Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, the pandemic we're facing right, right now is, is a real breakthrough in, in terms of Moroccan standing and Moroccan habits. Because for the first time, at least in, in two or three generations, people are thinking about their survival. And as you know, uh, satisfying uh, need or, or want is, is the motor of your consumption. But when you move from projecting yourself into the future to a survival state, the whole consuming habits change with it. So we entered in a phase that is really sensitive for many Moroccan households, where by being locked down and by having no, no, uh, no future insight in terms of combating this pandemic, they entered psychologically in a state of mind of survival instead of, instead of thriving. And this has a lot of uh, impact on their, on their way of thinking, on their way of in investing, on, on their way of consuming. And, and even when the government uh, gave aid to many Moroccans, they did not spend it right away. They, 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 uh, they saved it just to be able uh, to stay as long as possible uh, and, and to, to, to support their, their families as long as possible during this crisis. So here we moved from a, a natural reflex state of mind in terms of, of economic behavior to a survival mode. And in a survival mode, our, our consumption habits uh, reaches a very low level because we are just satisfying the minimum. So the economy is slowing down with this change of habits during the, the, the pandemic. So we will, face, we, will, we will face two stages. The first one is during the pandemic where the reflexes are, are, are at the survival mode and after uh, the pandemic and the change in, in consuming habits after the pandemic will depend upon the, the policies carried out by the government. If the government is is, uh, is is reassuring people they will they will they will they will go back to their consuming habits very very quickly but if moroccan people moroccan household project a longer uh, lockdown or a longer uh, cohabitation with this with this virus then they will stay in this survival mode for very long time and this is the first change in habits we witnessed the, during this crisis so people are, are trying to save as much money as possible to be able to last the, the, the longest during, the, during yeah. this crisis. And even their, their, their consuming habits moved to a survival mode. Mr. Haddad, Professor Adel makes a valid point, but when Moroccans are not saving, what would they be spending their money on? To be exact, 
when comparing consumer perception of local products to non-local products? Will Moroccan consumers appreciate local products and services more or uh, and will they be more competitive? competitive? Uh, let me just address the, the problem with the, the saving behavior. If you, oh. I mean, there, there was a study by the High Commissariat for Planning and it said that 34% of the households of, from the sample that has been studied have been affected and 22% of them used their savings in order to deal with the situation. 14% res, uh, res, resorted or had recourse to loans and 8% of them, it was financial aid from government that they used. Um, but at the same time, I mean, like what, what happened is like there is a mixed kind of behavior. There was uh, at one moment a hoarding kind of, uh, of uh, I mean, there were more expenses related to people being afraid. And so they went on a spending free at the very beginning and when they were hoarding food and hoarding other things. And then afterwards, when the situation normalized, then they spent more money on hygiene related expenses, acquiring also e-learning equipment for their kids and also some of them for themselves. I mean, especially for middle income families, but they are spending less on what they used to spend, especially for urban families when they go, for example, out and then they use restaurants or they use, for example, malls and all of that. So it evens out. But I mean, at the same time, what we need to understand is like, most of the middle family, middle, middle class families, they don't have a lot of margin for spending at normal times because like 30% of their earnings go to paying loans and then 60% goes to housing and food. So any kind of extra expenses come only from those 10% and of course from the loans that they get. Uh, this, is, this is in a situation where savings generally in Morocco only make like about 30% of GDP. So this is a very interesting situation where there are like less expenses on some specific things, but there are more expenses on other things at the same time that a lot of the middle class families who have been employed uh, with the private sector and have lost their jobs have seen also their income going down. So if we're earning, for example, something like 5,000 dirhams, which is $500, then you will go down if you lose your job to only about $200. So that's a highly reduced revenue. Whereas those who are employees with the government, then those like retain their own kind of income, but lost only three days because of that's the, that's the, the solidarity that they pay for, uh, I mean, that they, they had to pay uh, uh, for the coronavirus kind of effort. In, in relation to the products, I mean, like, will they, uh, will they will they appreciate local, local products? Product. Maybe. This is the idea that is being debated and there are a lot of debate around that. The government is thinking to put some barriers to encourage buy buying Moroccan, but it all depends on an awareness campaign about Moroccan products first, but also just how much barriers, uh, yeah, I mean like tariff barriers and non-tariff barriers Morocco could put, especially for for, for objects that come from China and Turkey, which are very, very cheap and highly affordable in agribusiness, in, uh, in, in apparel and textile. Those are the kinds of products. But, but, but the, the other thing also is like competitiveness uh, for the Moroccan product should be in the combination of two things, quality and prices. It's a tendency in Moroccan products when there is quality, then they are more expensive. So that kind of, but plus a lot of companies prefer to export when it's high quality because there is high added value. For example, like when, when, when we produce the, the masks for people to use during coronavirus, a lot of companies prefer to sell them outside Morocco because there is a high added value to that. That's also a problem that we need to deal with in order to encourage Moroccans to buy Morocco. But the coronavirus itself did not, after again 82 days of lockdown, did not to Moroccans had did not have any added value to the Moroccan consumer per se. I mean, we're focusing here on the COVID nineteen. Right. Do you think that's correct? That, that's correct. That's correct. And 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 as uh, as Mr. Adil said, then there was because there was this kind of survival uh, uh, behavior. 
uh, in Moroccans as, as a reaction during the coronavirus. So a lot of people did not have the choice but to, to, to buy whatever they could lay their hands on and then go back home. So this was not like, I mean, like there was the, the, the choice, is, I mean, like buying as, as a form of shopping and going around and all of that is not, is not happening yet. And that would not happen probably until like things will go back to normal. That's when we will see that behavior if Moroccans are going to spend, I mean, like to spend more on, on Moroccan products or not. Well, to look at, I mean, you both mentioned survival. To look at a slightly different aspect of consumer spending, this pandemic was very revealing in terms of what is necessary and what is not. So Professor Adil, are there any indicators to forecast Moroccan spending behavior on entertainment and non-essential services and goods? Will it decrease? Will it increase? Is there anything in particular you can tell us? Well, uh, thank you, Asma, for, for this question. Let me build on what Professor Haddad said. When, when you have uh, this crisis that lasts only three months, it's too soon to foresee a radical change in consuming behavior. Okay. Although it was very hard, although it was very challenging emotionally, but changing in consumers' behaviors takes longer time. Okay, So in Morocco, we have two, two kinds of attitudes. And, and I don't like this, this, this recent call for, uh, for consuming Moroccan because for me, it doesn't sound right. Be Why not? Morocco, uh, Moroccan, Moroccan people uh, consume local production when it is affordable and available, as Professor Haddad said. So we will not consume Moroccan products if they are not affordable or if they are not available. Now, if we, when we need to to cons when we need to buy a car, when we need to buy a TV, when we need to buy a, a cell phone. We cannot consume Moroccan because the, the product simply doesn't exist. So here we have we have this um, this rhetorical uh, idea that in every crisis we think that the solution is to consume local products. No, the solution is to consume the right products in terms of of price and in terms of quality. And if the Moroccan producers cannot discipline themselves. To be able to be able to to guarantee uh, the same product with, with at least the same quality and the, the same range of prices, then we cannot push Moroccan to consume local just because uh, and uh, under some um, some nationalist catchphrases. This is not how more e the economy should work. The economy should work on rational basis, and the rational basis, a producer using the same factors of production should deliver the same product with the same price and the same quality. If it's not the case, it's not the, it's not the fault of the consumer. It's the fault of the producer. Now, Mor when Moroccan people go to the supermarkets in terms of, of food products or textile products, they have quite a lot of Moroccan, Moroccan, uh, Moroccan products. But in certain, in, for certain needs, there is simply no Moroccan production. And we cannot ask them to change their, their behavior overnight just be, be, because they were locked down for, for 82 days and start consuming Moroccan, even though those products are, are expensive are, or not available. So here we, we need to, to maintain our, our focus on what should the Moroccan producers and not consumers do to, uh, to interest their consumers. Of course, you can, you can add some, some dose of of nationalism, but this is not the solution to the to the economic problem. The solution to the economic problem is, is to push, is, 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 sorry, is to put as much pressure as one can on the producers, so they so, so they, 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 they are, they are uh, ready to to produce good good goods with with the right price. Now, in terms of of, of, of the saving of the saving behavior, as Professor Haddad uh, mentioned it. When you have a household that is struggling to pay their, their uh, I, I think he, he mentioned the 35%. If, if what is left for him is 65% of his income, then they should, they should use every dirham to satisfy their, uh, their needs. And we cannot ask them to pay 
a product a higher price at lower quality just because it's Moroccan. It's labeled made in Morocco. It is too much pressure on them. Okay. So the focus here should be on the producer and not the consumer, if, if you allow. Me. Well, I find it interesting that you qualify the, the period as a short time, a short time or short term period, uh, because an off cited research claims that it takes 21 days to develop a new habit for anybody to develop a new habit. Now, again, this is 82 days of lockdown, which is four times uh, around four times the 21 days that the research claims. So my question, Mr. Haddad, how will that translate to consumer behavior in Morocco? What I mean is we noticed a shift towards digitalization, even at government level, whether in creating websites and information portals or establishing distant learning processes. But can we expect Moroccan consumers to move towards e-commerce, sorry, and online purchasing and so on? Yeah, let me just address one thing and then before I answer that question go with, ahead. With regarding uh, uh, consumption of non-essential services and goods. What, what we need to do is, and I agree with uh, with Adil, is that we need to watch out. We need to, to wait and see. Uh, and I think there has been like some sort of shift in consumer behavior in this period. People are probably spending less on non-essential stuff. And will that continue afterwards, especially that people are becoming poorer, they have lost their jobs, some of them their revenue, some of them will stay jobless and all of that. So that's something we need we need to watch. But but it, it looks like, and these are my predictions and it, they have to be confirmed, people will cut on travel, I mean, on the, on the short-term basis, they will probably cut on buying new cars. Those who wanted, who had wanted to invest in a second home, probably they will put a halt on that. Changing furniture for, for, for the home, that also they will put uh, a halt to that. So maybe that's in, in the foreseeable future. But they will probably buy more technology for e-learning and e-governance needs, especially now that there is, there is, a, there is a, move, a movement within government. There is a lot of digitalization that is happening. So a lot of, for example, you can pay your taxes now. I mean, like you can pay your bills, you can pay electricity that are even like the companies which are like 60% of everything you can get in all of that. And especially if government moves to what they call like, for example, uh, a digital identity. And also if, uh, for example, like the, the cash transfers that are done to the poor are done uh, via wallet. And if, it's, if they do the technology of wallet in which you transfer the money as digital on a mobile phone, and then people can use that mobile phone in order to go to grocery shop, shop and, and, and buy, provided that you provide those shops with, with the right kind of equipment. I think there will be like a massive movement towards, uh, towards uh, digitalization and e-commerce. It is already happening, I mean, e-commerce. And I think people are now buying, some are buying groceries. I know people are buying gadgets, they're buying clothes and all of that. And, and when people know that they, those are cheaper because they are cheaper because people who are, who, are, who, are, who are selling those use only like they store them somewhere and they don't need them I mean, to put them in any kind of showroom. They don't need to put them in shops, whatever. So they don't spend a lot on them. And that's why they can afford to sell them at a lower price than what is found in shops. When Moroccans find out that if you buy digital, then it's going to be cheaper then digitalization may, 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 may become like a very important like consumer behavior. And also it may drive some stores out of business uh, as well. That's what, what was going to happen. But I think also that, that a lot of businesses will move into that because they, they, they will find that it's a niche. A lot of people will be using their credit cards, but I mean, also people will be using like mobile wallets in order to, de to, to do that, especially if government like keeps pushing for that. You know, there was a debate at the very beginning when they were starting to do the cash transfers towards the, 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 the households that are affected. And they said, OK, let's do it as a wallet kind of technology. If had that had happened, it would have really transformed the whole setting. But because at the moment of the lockdown, it was very difficult to equip all the shops, 
with the, the right kind of technology. That's why they kind of, of postponed that idea. But I think should the governments continue to transfer money towards the poor and also towards the middle class, that will happen very soon. And it will be like a very good, very, uh, it, it, it will be a driver of digitalization as well. Well, see, that's exactly what I want to fo follow up on and focus on. What about businesses? To this day, many businesses do not offer electronic methods of payment in their establishments. We're talking even about cafes. Are we to expect Moroccan small businesses to make a significant shift towards digitizing their businesses? And you've, you've talked about it, but does Morocco really have the infrastructure for it? Well, I mean, I, I think they won't have a choice if a lot of shops, I mean, we are talking about like small businesses which are in a non-formal sector. And those non-formal sector, the reason why they don't want to use the technology is like because they don't want to have like traceability. They don't want to be traced and then they don't want to have any problems with the, with the, with the tax authorities. But if there is like a whole concerted effort on the part of government to move them towards like some sort of formal kind of system, with a lot of uh, with 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 help from government in terms of the acquisition of that equipment, and if the consumer is demanding that, I don't think they will have a choice. Uh, Mr. Adel, do you have any comments or uh, interjections to what? Mr. Yes, Adel yes, yes. Let, let, no, let me just go back to what you said about go the ahead. twenty the twenty one days. In fact, in terms of consumer behavior, you ha you, we have three main frames uh, time frames within which. The, the consumer behavior changes over time. The first one is the short term, and this depends on the level of your revenues. Once your revenues increase, you will, you will move from non uh, essential goods to non-essential goods, and this is in short term. So you, your, your, your behaviors and your consumer behaviors change, I'm sorry, your consumer behaviors change with the change of your, of, of your income. The richer you get, uh, the the more you move toward non essential, non -essential goods for your uh, for your consumption. Now you you have the second the second uh, time frame, which is medium medium term, and then and that depends on the state of the offer, of of on uh, depends on on technology. Uh, twenty year, twenty or thirty years ago, we didn't have uh, cell phones, even though the need was there. But there, 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 there was no offer there, so it depends. The second time frame depends on on the state of technology and the state of the offer, and the supply. And the third time frame, which is at, at longer, at longer range, is demographical, cultural, and historical changes. Okay, and this this occurs within a longer, longer uh, time frame. So here we, we we are really at the short and of the time frame of consumer behavior. So within 82 days, it's maybe you can, you, can, you can witness a minor changes, but I'm not talking about changes that affect the whole economy. Okay, because it is too soon, the, the state of supply. Sorry, can you still hear me? Yes, yes, I can, go ahead. Yes, the state of the supply didn't have time to adjust to the new a consumer behavioral shift. So it's too soon to, to talk about a radical change in consumer behavior. Okay, we need first to see what will happen to the income of the household. Will it, will it uh, go up, go down or stay, or stay put? So this is the first determinant of their, be, their consumer behavior. And the second one is how quickly will the supply adapt it's 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 uh, it's structure to to meet this this new demand for example you you, you give the, the, the example of digitalization yes we have some some companies were very quick to to adapt and to adjust their production to the to, to the new state of demand but this is not the case of the whole economy and and you just gave the, the, the relevant example of of small cafes small restaurants and small uh, small businesses they need to have an offer a supply that's, that, that can equip them with, uh, with, with terminals of, of mobile payments, and they should have the cultural uh, change to accept them. As, uh, as Professor Haddad said, you have a lot of them, even though they have a tax code, but they operate in a non-formal part of the economy. So this is a change of behavior 
I'm talking about, but that will occur in the longer uh, range of, uh, of, of the change of consuming behavior. So here we have three time frames, and 82 days is just too soon. Maybe you can witness some changes in some individual behaviors uh, here and there, but as in, uh, for the economy as a whole, I think it is, uh, it is too soon. Thank you. Um, uh, let us focus a little bit more on tourism in Morocco post-pandemic. Uh, Mr. Haddad, the international travel website Travel Daily News has named Morocco one of the top destinations for tourists will flock to once the COVID-19 pandemic wanes. Can we hope that Moroccans would see their country the same way international tourists do? I think let's hope so. The the only thing is like we need also to provide them uh, with a product that meets their expectations. Uh, one of the problems uh, for Moroccans is like when they go to Moroccan hotels, then they end up spending more money than the foreigners because the foreigners will come with the tour operator and because they come with the tour operator, then the tour operator gets like a series of rooms for 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 the whole year and they get them at very low prices and that's why they sell them to uh, uh, i mean as a package to a european tourists who will come to morocco and then will be only spending 40 dollars or 50 dollars on a room whereas a moroccan when they go individually moroccan or another one when they go individually then they will have to pay uh, more for that so if we need to encourage them then we need to have also a tour operator or a carrier or some sort of platform in Morocco that caters to Moroccan needs in the sense that it goes to hotels in Marrakesh, in Agadir and other places, and then buys like quite a few rooms and then put them in a package and then sells them to Moroccans. That's number one. Number two, we tax more the Moroccans than with, uh, I mean, like than, than the foreigners, because when you are doing like business for in outside, it's considered as export, and therefore you pay on corporate tax only 17.5%. Whereas if when you do it like locally, it's about 30%. So a lot of hotels would prefer to do their, their business, I mean, like with, 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 with foreign tourists. So that's the second one. And third one, we think of Moroccans as only coming to hotels and using them, whereas there is not like too much in terms of entertainment for the Moroccan family. Some hotels do it, but not a lot of them. So for example, like you go to Marrakesh, but that's it. I mean, like you stay in a hotel, the kids will be probably playing in, in there, in, in a swimming pool and all of that, and that's it. But I mean, like when you, when foreigners come, they come and then they come with a whole program and then they will go do sightseeing, they go and doing like sports activities, they go do cultural activities and all of that. We need to treat the Moroccan tourists in that way as well and provide them with that kind of, of, uh, of uh, product. But the other thing also, and maybe you are going to ask that later, is that why do Moroccans go, for example, to places like Spain or other places? Sure. Well, Maybe that's a question that you're going to ask, but Go let, ahead, me, let, please. let me let me respond to that. Uh, I mean, there are Moroccans who would prefer to go to a place where they are free to to use to you. I mean, like where they are free in their own social behavior as vacationers. So they would like to have a beer somewhere. They would like to stand, stay in the terrace and do that. They would like to go in shorts. They would like to go and dance and all of that. They feel free. Whereas, for example, here in Morocco, as Moroccans, they feel some sort of social pressure. That's number one. For example, but the other thing also, like in the summer, people would want to go to Moroccan beaches. They're beautiful. They're even like better than, 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 than beaches in Spain or in other places. But the problem is like they are not very well organized as in other places in the sense that you'll find a lot of young people like playing and all of that. There is not too much security. There is not too much. I mean, there is a lot of harassment, for example, when you are a woman and all of that. That needs to be addressed. And you need to be addressed that at the local level with the local municipalities, with local authorities and provide the right kind of environment for the Moroccans to stay home and then consume. Moroccans would love to go to Al Jadida, to go to Gadir, like to go to, 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 to the beaches in, 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 uh, in Mediterranean, but I mean, like enjoy those beaches as vacationers, as people who are using the beaches and women would want to do it, but we want to do it and then feel free and not rest and all of that. If we don't address this, then we cannot talk about like local tourism and Moroccans going, this is, this is offer and demand. I mean, this is, if you offer them, if you offer Moroccans uh, a, a product and a service that is up to their expectations, then they would not go to Spain. How much would you say that 
the infrastructure or rather the lack of proper infrastructure in the reason for Moroccans who can afford international travel go for international travel rather than stay home. And well, I, mean, stay I, I don't think you can avoid like international travel and I think people like if they want to go internationally then they, sh they should and there are people who love to have vacation outside and when we need to use that I mean instead of uh, thinking of that, of that as a negative thing it's an opportunity for like travel agents and also organizers of travel to deal with those Moroccans who are going abroad. No one, I mean, like just very few who deal with that. For example, there are packages for Thailand, there are packages for Turkey, but there are no packages, for example, for Spain, except if you go to the Canary Islands. So I think what we needs to be done is like for the Moroccan tourism professionals to get into that market. It's a market. Moroccans going abroad, it's a market. I think what we need to do is work on their expectations if they want to stay in Morocco, and then we're going to catch a part of those. But we need also to organize better those, the outgoing, because tourism is also outgoing, it's not only incoming. We, not, we, 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 we should not be selfish in the sense that we want people to come to us, but we're not going to go anywhere. But I think we need to organize that so that we can benefit from that in terms of business, for the tourism companies, but also in terms of taxes as well. I mean, like if there is a billion dirhams, that's the estimation that goes to Spain and probably Turkey and all of that, then why, if, if it's organized very well by the Moroccan business, the tourist business, then probably like a good part, which is 20 or 30 percent, will stay in Morocco as money because it will be organized from here. Professor Adil, uh, Mr. Haddad pointed out to uh, how what we can do to make uh, Morocco a cost-effective destination. Now, as it stands right now, is do you think that the purchasing power of Moroccan households, especially after COVID-19 and everything we just mentioned about how it drained uh, Moroccan pockets, is it strong enough for Moroccans to be uh, significant enough for them to be contributors through internal tourism? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the last part of your question. Of course. Uh, how is the purchasing power of Moroccan households, especially after COVID-19, how does it, uh, is it strong enough for Moroccans to be significant contributors through internal tourism? Okay, so I, I, I just feel a lot of pressure uh, talking about tourism and the, with the former <laughs> Minister of Tourism. So I just, uh, I will just share with you some thoughts. So I, I don't think it will be only a matter of, of income after COVID-19. It depends on, on the state of the central emergency and how the, the authorities will deal, will deal with, that, with this aspect because nobody wants want to go to a hotel where he, where he has to maintain a social distance, where he cannot enjoy a full, vac uh, full holiday. You know what I mean? So this, I think this will be the main, the main obstacle to, to, the, to encouraging uh, internal tourism within this time frame of, uh, of two or three coming months, because now we're talking about uh, expanding the, the lockdown two, two, or two, two more weeks. So this will affect immensely the behavior of, uh, of Moroccan tourists, because when, when, when one wants to, uh, to go on, on holiday, we, we don't like to, to have barriers. We don't like to have uh, uh, constraints on our behaviors. So it's, it's already hard enough not to have enough money to pay for those uh, holidays. But now if we, if, if we have to go to, to a hotel and we should stay in, 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 in our homes, we cannot go to a swimming pool, we cannot go to the beach, we cannot go shopping because of the, the social distance and, uh, and the, the barriers. So this will just slow down considerably the, the activity, the touristic activity in in Morocco, but but this is on on a short term. But but let's let's see what's what's happening in a broader in a broader view. If every country tries to encourage uh, the internal tourism and succeed to do to do so, we will have no international tourism. Tourism is by definition going outside abroad. Okay, so the, it's the same. It's the same. It's the same concept. If Moroccan, uh, if the Moroccan people do not consume Moroccan tourism, is that because we have we have structural uh, deficiencies 
uh, Professor Haddad uh, gave some of them uh, when he was developing his uh, his view on internationalism. Uh, you cannot ask for for Moroccan to pay twice the price of uh, of better uh, of better journey in Turkey or in, in in Thailand just because it's a Moroccan product. It's 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 too uh, it's too demanding for them. Okay, you cannot uh, ask someone to pay five thousand dirhams or more just for a weekend in uh, in Marrakesh, while he can for for quite the same price have a week or more uh, in, in, in another country. So this is a structural problem we have in this country. We need to, to, to shift the pressure from the consumer to the producer. Once you will have a good product, once you will have a good service, once you will have a good, uh, good program for me to enjoy my, my holidays, people will go, will go automatically. But as we, you have a growing middle class, and in increase in revenues, people will will go abroad. Now, our focus as 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 Moroccan should be to attract as many foreign tourists as we can. But the Moroccan, but Moroccan people, either he can afford uh, holidays abroad, and he will he will visit them for cultural reasons to discover the world, and it, it's legitimate concern. Or he cannot afford them, and then we should have programs for people who want to spend 10 days in, uh, in their country without having to put a two or three or four months salary. Okay, so uh, again, we should focus the shift, uh, I'm sorry, we should focus uh, the pressure from the consumer to the producers. Once we will have a good product at a reasonable price with a good program, uh, people will go automatically to, to consume that, that product. And it's not, it's not only about tourism, it's about every good or service. Supply and demand. Uh, thank yes. you for this lively conversation. I would like to Can now- Can I just add one thing? Uh... Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I, I mean, like we're talking about like Moroccans consuming tourism domestically. And I think what is happening, we should all, it, is that 30, 2% of Moroccan tourism, I mean, like of tourism in general is Moroccan, is done by local travelers. So it's not, it's not a small thing. I mean, like it's about a third. I mean, of course, mature destinations is when it gets to 40% or 50%. For example, in the US, it's, a, it's about 70% as domestic uh, travel and domestic also consumption. So it's high end. But I mean, like, for example, in places like, like Spain, it's about 40%. In France, it's the same thing. It's about 40% or so. So that's what we're, we should be driving at. But, at, but for example, like in, in, in Marrakesh, uh, when, there, when there was the crisis in 2014 and 15, the ISIS crisis, and then there was a huge drop in the French market, it was the Moroccans actually who saved the situation. They were the first consumers. So Moroccans were the first consumers. And they play... They, they, are, they are the second after the French, and sometimes they play the first role. The same thing happens also in Agadir. And, and Agadir used to be like 70 to 80%, like mostly foreign travelers. A lot of Moroccans did not go, but with the highway, now Moroccans are coming and they are very strong in Agadir. But there are destinations which are completely Moroccan, for example, Tangier, Al Jadida, Fez, for example, Saidiya, and all of those. The only problem with some of those kinds of destinations is like it goes mostly towards non non formal kind of market. So people would go and then uh, and then rent houses outside of the circuit and all of that. That's one of the things. That's one of the niches where a lot of work needs to be done. If you see, for example, tens of thousands of people going to Al Jadida in the summer, going to Ifran, or going to Tangier, or going to Tetuan, and all of them, and then get in houses and all of that, that that's something that needs to be organized it needs to be organized in a very intelligent manner so that at the same time those there could be some taxes out of that there could be some business for the tourism people out of that but there could also be an organized thing because it's and 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 that that's something that that, that could be done very easily and it could be done all throughout the year in order to reduce the seasonality that exists for example like in northern destinations also in mountain destinations Thank you. Thank you for this lively conversation. I would like to now take questions from our audience, starting with um, 
Uh, Hamza Belfqih says, I think that uh, right after the lockdown being lifted, private spending will skyrocket in an attempt to catch up with the psychological impact of lockdown time consumption deprivation. That consumption curve will take its natural co course as, ch as change in consumption implies change in income and culture, etc. Do you agree, um, Mr. Haddad? Let me know if I need to read that again. I, 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 I don't understand the question. It means like there has been a skyrocketing of, of consumer behavior after the lockdown. Is that right? He thinks that, that, should, that that's probably what will happen. I think he says, I think that the right, that's right after the lockdown being lifted, private spending will skyrocket in an attempt to catch up with psychological impact of lockdown. Maybe, uh, maybe that that that's one of expect that what that's one expectations, and, and I think people have been frustrated for so long, locked down, and all of that. Some of them may have may have also like some money, I mean, to save so that they would spend <laughs> it. So that's also that's a possibility. But we need to take into consideration that people will be more careful. There will be like social distancing. People will be will not go to places where there's a lot of uh, there is there are crowds and all of that. For example, if a restaurant is crowded, then they may not go there. If there is a cafe that is crowded, they probably will not go there. So we will have to see. But that that's one of the expectations that is happening. For example, in Paris now, it has happened in the states when the the, the lockdown has been lifted. A lot of people rushed into consuming, but but in some this in some places it did not happen. For example, in Dubai then they opened the restaurants and the cafes at 30 percent when you look at them now i mean they're not even at five percent people are still afraid of the coronavirus so that kind of spending spree that was expected of people after the lifting of the lockdown did not happen we'll have to wait and see for that thank you um question to you mr professor adil uh, hibal Hark says harak says i firmly believe that internal tourism should be a legitimate and primordial part in governmental uh, in the governmental post pandemic plans to support the economy's recovery again do you think i mean you've spoken extensively about internal tourism being a supply demand uh, combination what can you tell uh, hibal harak Yes, if uh, that's a good question. Yes, if we want to to help Moroccans in financially to spend to spend vacancies in in, uh, in their country, why not? But this is a momentary measure. It will not it will not uh, solve the structural problem of the sector. Okay, and and today uh, the, the internal tourism can can save part of. Uh, of the year, but only if the psychological barrier is lifted. And as we expanded for two more weeks, the, the lockdown, this will not help. Okay, so there is, there is a psychological effect that we cannot ignore. People would not go to, to spend their holidays with, uh, with a mask on and uh, with the uh, with the limitation to, to their movement, to their, to their behavior, it's simply not worth it. Okay, they'd rather stay at home, uh, watch, I'm sorry, watch Netflix, I'm sorry for the ad, and, uh, and not have to spend money, okay, and not, and not get the service, not because of the fault of, uh, of the hotel, of the tourist uh, authors, actors, but because of social barriers during this pandemic. So internal tourism will work only if there is a psychological barrier that is lifted. And as, as, as of now, I don't see it uh, coming. We are talking about more uh, two weeks of, uh, of, of lockdown, additional lockdown. You, you have no, no end in sight. And as people are unable to project themselves, they will, they will prefer rather use the, the money at their disposal wisely, then to go spend them on a vacancy where we'll, they will not enjoy. Uh, Ali bin Sba'a Sba to Mr. Haddad. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Haddad. What should the government do to save the tourism industry? They are absolutely silent. Would you agree? And what do you tell Ali bin, bin Sba'a? 
I, I think they need to do to take like some bold steps in order to save the tourism uh, industry. This is like a 7.3 billion uh, industry that I mean, like in terms of, of uh, foreign currency, it's 13 billion dollar industry with about like 700,000 people working in it, two point million people working in directly, nine million families living off tourism. There are cities that live off tourism like at 90 percent, like Marrakesh at 50 or 60% like Agadira, 35% like Casablanca. So this is a huge sector which impacts also the handicraft industry and also impacts the airline industry and the, the tourism transport uh, road, in, uh, road, road industry. So I think they need to do it. Uh, <clears throat> for the moment, the governments, I think they are willing to do it. They're still probably they're talking. I think they've been meeting like yesterday and today. Uh, and the day before with the industry in order to, to make a proposition. There is a Minister of Tourism who is coming on Monday to the Parliament. She's going probably to announce the kinds of measures. What, what I would probably do is, is first thing is uh, alleviate any kind of problems or any kind of uh, loans and also uh, arrears in, 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 in fiscal, uh, uh, I mean like in taxes and also in contribution to social security for a year's time so anyone who has loans within the industry or who has for example like taxes to pay or social i mean like a contribution to social security should be all postponed like for a year and number two is give them enough uh, i mean like uh, give a loan in order to alleviate their cash flow problems because all of them will have cash flow and then if you want them like to really come back to business quickly, we need to get, but those loans need to be, I mean, like it, it needs to be like 0% interest for a seven year period and with a grace period of two years for them to really like use that money without feeling the pressure of, 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 of uh, I mean, like needing to, to reimburse like very quickly. And then we need also to work with the, with the, the National Office for Tourism, which is the authority that deals with a lot of, I mean, like with, the, with, with, the, with communication about Morocco in order to go and get tourists where they are. But this means like also helping the Royal Air Morocco and also other companies so that they could bring like tourists to Morocco and then find out which markets now are available and ready in order to bring those tourists. Uh, especially now, I, th I think Morocco has, has a brand, has, it's a destination that is very well known and you, have, you, you, you can see that. I mean, like there are a lot of people, different kinds of countries when they think about traveling, then Morocco comes up as one of the destinations that you want to, to go to. So there is, there is, the brand is there, the, the popularity is there and I think we need just to work on that. Uh, I want to talk, I want to add one comment that is rather interesting, uh, and I'll combine two. Yunus Azgar and uh, Hussein Uhlis. Uh, Yunus Azgar says the state should invest in rural tourism deeply to create opportunities for rural people to accept the choice with the other rural products. And then uh, Hussein Uhlis says Morocco is not only Marrakesh, we shouldn't focus only on fresh tourists, we should create targets other uh, we should target other markets and other niches in tourism so these both of them talk about rather niche markets um prof, uh, professor uh, Adil, maybe you can answer the question yes i think i think professor Haddad will be more uh, more relevant than me yes <laughs> <laughs> sure then move on moving on to mr uh Haddad. what would you uh, come uh, on no, rural I, tourism <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Professor Adil. I think those are very relevant questions, very important questions. I think they need to, uh, when I was minister, I worked on putting a fund, uh, the way I called it the Qariyati Fund, which is like a fund in order to help putting together those small products in different kinds of places, in Azilal, in Tikig, in, in Rashidia, in Shawan, in, in different places all around the country. And we, we put together something like a thousand projects that could be done in these concern, like small kinds of auberges, small kinds of restaurants, places where people can then showcase their own little products and all of that, and then circuits within the, the rural areas and oases, for example, like if you go from Warzazet to Agdiz to Zagura and to 
uh, all the way to Mohammed Ghazlan, you find different kinds of oases that could be worked as 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 product. That's a very um, uh, um, uh, that's a very ambitious kind of program. And fortunately, it has not been funded very well. I tried to get like a loan for that from the World Bank, and then. We were close to dealing with the project and then the government decided that there was other priorities and then they shifted the money to that. I hope they should come to that because that's a very important one. It, it will diversify the income of a lot of people in the rural areas who only, I mean, base their, their revenue on agriculture. And that's an important thing. And the number two is, is develop this kind of niche that should grow to become like a mainstream thing, which is ecotourism, because we need to become like a reference a destination when it comes to sustainable tourism. And I think that those are very good questions. I, I know that Ohlis probably is from Figig, that's why I mentioned Figig. <laughs> um, Caroline Haddad, I'm of Moroccan origins living in Sweden. I have to say that everyone I know in Tangier go to Spain for vacation. Uh, vacation in Morocco is too expensive nowadays. What do you think? Uh, Mr. Adil, do you want to yes, take that question? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, that's what I, I was talking about. You cannot ask Moroccan to consume Moroccan products just because they are Moroccan. Being Moroccan should be an asset, not a liability. And we can help, but but to a certain extent. When you have, when, when you can spend uh, a weekend and that will cost you much, much, uh, much more than, than, than a week abroad, there is something, there is something that, that is not quite right in this in, in this equation. So, the the tourism in Morocco lacks heavy infrastructure. Okay, we have we have touristic activity. We have not a touristic industry where people can go and and spend a week or two in in a city enjoying themselves with 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 a lot of entertaining activities. We just have hotels and swimming pools and that's it. And some and and now we have more and more malls. But, but you don't have an integrated uh, touristic sector where, where people can, for example, uh, if I spend uh, one week or 10 days in Marrakesh, Agadir, Tangier, Fez, Meknes, I can do, go, go do this the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, and I have a program uh, to enjoy my, my, my holidays. So basically when people come to Morocco, it's, it's for a, a nice cozy hotel and a swimming pool. And you don't have, beyond that, you, do, you don't have a touristic activity, a touristic industry that's, that allows people to spend a good time in Morocco. So we, we, we just limited ourselves to having nice hotels, uh, using, uh, using our, uh, our natural infrastructure, but we did not add to that a real touristic industry. And this is, this is the problem. So in, in, in that fashion, we could not achieve uh, the economies of scale to allow us to, to send the Moroccan product at a reasonable price. While other countries reaching 20, 30, 40 million tourists have achieved that kind of economies of scale and were able to, to, uh, to provide their, their, their local tourists and the foreigners with, with the product at a reasonable price. So the problem in Morocco is that we have, I think around five to six million foreign tourists and this is just not enough to achieve the economies of scale and we need to to target 10 20 25 and for this you, we, we need a heavy investments and change in mindset so so this investment and this 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 change in mindset are still not there so the consequence is that we have a tourism that is very expensive and focused on two to three cities mainly Marrakesh and Agadir for, uh, for foreign uh, tourism. And it is just not enough. Morocco has a lot of assets, uh, good uh, history, and, uh, and uh, Mo Moroccan people are very welcoming. But in terms of infrastructure, in terms of, 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 of supply, we still have lots of weaknesses to, to, to address. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask one final question. The question Please, before, uh, go ahead. Can I just say something? Of course something? you can. Um, uh, I think we probably with, with COVID-19 and after COVID-19, then a huge numbers will probably not be an option in so many destinations. Uh, and I think people, if they ever travel like long, for example, if they come from Sweden to Morocco, 
instead of staying the five days or six or seven days that they used to do, then probably they would want to stay more. And at the same, uh, that, that's one thing. So probably there will be a change of behavior in, in a lot of tourists. And then they will be looking for destinations which are safe health-wise and all of that. That's one. Number two, uh, I, I think that the choice of Morocco was not to go to, for example, uh, tourism like what happens in the, in, the, in the Canary Islands or in Tunisia, or for example, in the Sharam Sheikh and also Ardaka in, in, in Egypt or in some of the destinations in Turkey. I mean, like Southern Turkey, not Istanbul. Istanbul is more cultural and all of that. And, and the reason is like, we are not too much working with tour operators because we, we wanted our destination to be high brand and because it's high brand, then the value is added, is higher added value. So we receive less tourists, but with added value. And the danger in, in the last few years is that we have a little bit reduced the value in order to attract more tourists. So we are now into 13 million, if we include the three or four million Moroccans and the other. But my issue with that is like we are reaching the 13,000 while reducing the value of the destination. And I don't think we should go there. We should leave it as up kind of upscale kind of destination with high added value. My, my, that's my. Thank you. Uh, I want to add again a question to you, but um, well, more like a comment to, to you, Mr. Haddad. Uh, Saeed Lughalid says, uh, when you go to India to import Arctic crafts, you are undercutting the local economy. Just because we mentioned um, international versus local, one final, briefly, one final comment about this. I, I didn't hear the, the, the question. The comment was, when you go to India to import for the Arctic craft, you are undercutting the local economy. What do you say to say it? True, and I, I uh, hi, Said Lalit. I know him from a long time ago when we used to do <laughs> a lot of discussions over the internet and all of that. And thank you for the question, Said. I, I agree. I agree definitely because uh, because what happens is that uh, the the imported handicraft from China, from India, from other places is actually making it very difficult for a lot of handicraft people, handicraftsmen here in Morocco and handicraft women to, to sell their products. And I think we need to do something about that. And I think that because, because of its high cultural uh, uh, connotation and also content, Moroccan products need to be branded and for, we, we, are, we are doing some branding, but it's very long. I mean, for example, there is the, the carpet from Jad, there is the carpet from Taznacht, and there is the carpet from, for example, the Glawa and all of that, where we need to do it all across the board for all the products. And we need to do like good branding and all of that. And then if somebody like brings in and then say, this is Belga, these are the babushes from Moroccan babushes, then they are not because we have the branded babushes and all of that. But that's work that needs to be done by the handicrafts industry, along with the authorities and all of that. And so that we can have like, and, and we need also to put like tariffs on those in order not to compete on the local market. That, that's something that we should do. And it's, uh, it's an obligation if we want to protect, to protect the, the handicraft industry, which really feeds millions of people, despite the fact that some of them live in very bad conditions. I mean, like a lot of the handicraft people uh, live in bad conditions because when, when they make a product, they sell it for a very low price. And you know who makes, the, who makes a lot of money out of it? The bazaar which makes a lot of money out of it. So actually they sell a carpet, for example, women sell a carpet for 600 dirhams or 700 dirhams. And it's like about two meter, one meter kind of carpet. They make it in the rural areas of Jad or Wadzam or Taznat, whatever. Then in the, when they sell it in Marrakesh, the bazaar people will sell it for 8,000 dirhams, which is a huge amount of money. What they have is very small margin. That also we need to deal with and in order to, to, to keep the money with actually the producers which are the women, which are also the handicraft people. Thank you. Uh, many countries around the world are expecting or at least wondering how this global pandemic will change their lives in the long term. In the case of Morocco, we continue to hope that this reality check would mean a change for the better as consumers, of course, but also as service providers. Thank you to our guests for answering the questions, Mr. Hassan Haddad, former Minister of Tourism, current member of parliament and board member of the parliamentary network on the World Bank and IMF, and Professor Nabil Adil, research professor and head of geopolitics and geoeconomics research group. 
And thank you, of course, to our audience thank you for the invitation. Watching, us, uh, watching our show tonight with me, your host, Asma Hibshawi, on Morocco World News. Thank you.